Nej, bare sæt dig. Yes, we will. Uh, I think we are about ready to begin. Uh, we had a little bit of problems getting people into the hall here. <laughs> uh, it, on the other days when you hear a bell ringing, it means that you need to go in here. <laughs> okay, so uh, welcome to our 21st World Conference. I'll just uh, say thank you all for, for joining us and thank you for the interest you show in participating in this very uh, important and interesting topic. I will just start out by saying thank you to our three helpers here because we have really used and misused them in this picture for the last two, three years. So they are standing up here or sitting up here in real life. Maybe we should. <laughs> Yes, so sometimes I think, uh, especially in planning the, a big event like this, that you kind of lose track of the fact that you actually do this to help some children. So we wanted the children to be here today, so we all just remember why we are in this area. Yes, um, I can say we are a little bit more than 500 people here, around 550, including the one-day tickets. And uh, there are representatives here from more than 50 countries. So again, give yourself a hand. I think it's very, um, well, I'll give you a hand then if you want. <laughs> yes. But I think more than 50 countries is, is quite a lot. And so we are very proud that so many have chosen to come. As you all know, this uh, conference is a combination of research papers and people, people sharing practical experience. And so I will get back to the, to the program uh, after we have had the first keynote. Uh, but I just need to say something before we begin uh, the conference itself. Many of you might not know this, but in Denmark we do not have a lot of things for gifted children. And I know this is also a concern in other countries, but we really have nothing. We applied for this conference three years ago, and I thought at that time we were really gaining some momentum in this area. And so we applied for the conference and we got it, and then we had a really big school reform in this country. And it sort of set us back to before zero, more or less. And so some things that, that were, you know, the conditions we had to work under then are not the same now, and that is unfortunate. Uh, but it, what is also very important is because we do not have any gifted centers or anything, that is what we will try to get as a result of this conference. This whole conference ha has been put together by volunteer work. And the majority of the work have been done by Susanna, if you can please stand up. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And, uh, uh, yeah, and, and then I, I did the other half, and we have some more helpers. We will say thank you to them on, on Wednesday, or on Thursday, of course, when we finish up. I'm just saying this because I know there are some things. We have had some questions, and I apologize. We will get it fixed, and just come to the registration and let us know what your concerns are, and we will help you. Okay, because this conference is done only by volunteer uh, work, we didn't have any funding to get started. So actually this conference is happening because we got financed by two sets of grandparents of gifted children. And again, it is uh, Susanna's uh, father, uh, your, yes, father, <laughs> Ole, could you stand up for a bit? <laughs> <laughs> And then my mother, who I guess was too shy to be here. <laughs> uh, you may say hi, yes, thank you. <laughs> we have some flowers for you, but I think they're out in the registration. You'll get them afterwards. <laughs> yes, okay. Like I just said, we are here because we all care for the well-being of gifted children. And uh, if there's one person who has also be, been caring for these children many years and also working a lot of volunteer hours, I know, it is the president of the World Council, Leslie Graves. So could you please come up here and say a couple of words? And then I will get back to you later. <laughs> Hi there. <laughs> 
Um, okay, as president of the World Council of Gifted and Talented Children, I would like to extend a warm welcome to all of our members, speakers, and participants to Ons, Denmark, hometown to, two, hometown to many well-known fairy tales, and the great storyteller himself, Hans Christian Andersen. At this, the opening ceremony of our 21st biannual conference. Our conference is held as a main event during the International Week of Gifted, the World Council for Gifted and Talented Children's worldwide celebrative initiative that takes place during the same week. Two years ago, we celebrated with the <clears throat> Raise the Kite for Gifted Awareness Project, and this week, at some point, we hope to launch a complementary project based around stories and storytelling. As a first part of our story, I would like to thank the many people in Denmark and abroad who have made this conference possible. And I would like to thank uh, Susanna and Tina and Oli and everybody else who worked so hard, and Tyler and just everyone who tried to make sure that this event came to pass in this absolutely wonderful venue that we're all enjoying today. Um, this is a charity organization, and it would not exist without the support and willingness of Denmark and all these other countries, past and present, who take on this major fundraising event every two years. For this vital service to your organization, countries of the world, you have our and each other's profound thanks for although the World Council is a kind of an umbrella for many other organizations, it has few outside resources of funding or income to help keep it going. And in return, it is our sincerest hope that the conference is successful in raising and heightening awareness and support within this region, and that in the future we will hear many good things, many good things. Perhaps Denmark will come to Australia in two years' time and tell us how their gifted support developments are progressing. I've heard there are some pretty exciting ideas in the pipeline. <laughs> and as an organization, we cer certainly <clears throat> have been very pleased with the success of the Parent Day, which I am told will be repeated and happening uh, here every year, but hopefully will also be happening in Australia um, as a welcome addition to our event. Parents do need to be celebrated. I'll take a moment to talk about our EC members quickly who come from many, many countries. They come from diverse backgrounds, both culturally and in gifted advocacy or education, as well as where they are economically in their own lives. I would like for us to take a moment and thank these selfless individuals who give so much of themselves, contributing to a difficult job of running an organization from all ends of the earth with no economic gain. These individuals give of their time and their expertise as unpaid voluntary contributors, and this should be commended. This diversity and selflessness is vital component and should be at the heart of our organization, and it's mirrored in the outreach work within our communities that we would wish to do. I would like to express my gratitude <clears throat> to the European Talent Network, ECHA, um, Fico Mundi, Combrazu, Jamaica, Ecuador, Mexico, all of these places who allowed me to experience the wonderful work that's being done in your areas, both virtually and in person over the last year. And we are incredibly excited to see so many of you here taking part in this conference. We have quite a large contingent of people from Brazil and a few other places that we haven't had um, <clears throat> before. Uh, we are honored by the presence of so many other organizations and countries and hope that uh, to have opportunities to experience or hear much more about what you are doing in your corner of the world. And for that, we also thank you. It is a wonderful thing to see so many familiar faces of folk that continue to attend our conferences year after year, seeking to learn new things, but also to meet old friends and reconnect with the heart of our worldwide community. It is exciting to note that there are over 50 countries represented here this week, providing great opportunities to experience and engage with diverse views and individuals from a multitude of backgrounds and cultures. This experience, this gathering of, glo of a global gifted community is the hallmark of our organization, and it, has been, <clears throat> and it has retained this uniqueness throughout its long, long history. 
Each of you attending today here has a story that, is, that in its telling is of great value to all of us, and we hope to collect some of these in the near future. Our tradition is to embrace the many faces of giftedness, talent, creativity, and innovation, and to acknowledge that there is a world of knowledge waiting out there, which we can help each other learn from, and perhaps use in our own practices, advocacy, investigations, and family and child development in our collective efforts to raise our kites of awareness and to serve gifted and talented children, as well as other gifted individuals around the globe. Speaking of stories, my own favorite fairy tale by Mr. Anderson has always been that of the ugly duckling. Even as a child, as <clears throat> though sad at the beginning, it deals with difference and search and struggle and transformation and the end, um, and at the end, the joyful encounter of finding one's tribe, very like the journey of so many of ourselves and so many of our young folks have taken. Helping our young folk to a place of belonging, contentment, and fulfillment comes from the interaction with many distinct individuals in their lives, their families, parents, educators, supporters, and other entities that they may meet along their way. As has been said before, it takes a village, and if this is so, then I urge you all to look around you at all those representatives of our global diverse village and all the many faces that are here, and please, Stand up, shake each other's hands. <clears throat> to all of you out there who are swans or helping to raise our swans, I say well done to you all and extend a thousand welcomes to you in our own World Council Village Square here in Ons, Denmark. And as our story starts to unfold tonight, let the celebrating and learning begin. <laughs> and thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I would also just like to say that um, another thing that we have here this evening, we have a few people who um, are also scholarship awardees. We have, I think we have three that were given through the uh, World Council Scholarship Fund, and we have two parents that uh, came here throughout the uh, Edna McMillan Fund that was provided by Dr. Dorothy Sisk. Would you stand up, Dorothy? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> and that's a wonderful thing to be able to provide, um, you know, the uh, attendance and the participation from some people who may not normally have been able to make the conference. And uh, with no more ado, I'm going to ask Humphrey Obora to please come up and introduce our first keynote speaker, uh, Shirley Cocott. You must be wondering why I'm cutting a club. Don't be scared, I'm not going to beat you up. Uh, first of all, I would like to let you know that I come from Kenya, and I know the most difficult thing is to sit in a hall and listen to speeches for a very long time without some action. And I enjoy some good knowledge, we have to do something small. So I want to ask you to do something small. May we all be upstanding. I'm sure you've all heard about the story about Kenya, about Hakuna Matata, isn't it? <laughs> there are no problems in Africa. <laughs> now, I want us, in, enough, I'm sure you watch your television before any fun, okay? Now I'm going to give you the tune. I know you're not going to remember the song, but it's normal. There'll be a little part you get, then you shout louder there. The part you don't know, you're going like that. We know that. Now this is the song. I do it first, and then I'll tell you when to join. Jambo, Jambo Kenya, Abari Yako. Muzuri sana, wageni, wakaribishwa, inchi yetu, hakuna matata. That's the part you know, isn't it? <laughs> right, so I'll do it, and when I do the club like this, you join me with hakuna matata, isn't it? But now, 
Let me first greet lady. Ladies, hi. Hi, ladies. Gentlemen, hoi. Yeah, that's the way to go. Jambo, jambo sana, habari yako, hakuna matata. Now let's go, start. We are going to do jambo, jambo sana. Jambo means, how are you? Sana means, so much to you. Okay? I'll do it one more time, then you follow. Jambo, jambo sana, habari yako. Hakuna matata. Now, let's go. Jambo, jambo sana, habari yako. Hakuna matata. Then I want to bring, when you hold your waist. Now go on your waist. Now hold your waist now. Now we're going to, to the chorus now. This is going to be crazy. <laughs> now, I will do the singer, and then you just do Hakuna Matata, Kenya Inchi Yetu, Hakuna. You do like. This is the waist, okay? And you let it loose. Hakuna Matata. And then you go the other one. That one is too much. You just do like, don't go too far. Don't go too far. Don't go too far. I'm back. Kenya inchi yetu, hakuna matata. Inchi yetu wetu, hakuna matata. And if you look at me, hakuna matata. No, you can go it anyway. Okay, let's. You, you guys have a problem. Now, let's, let's get started. It's about 30 seconds to go. Kenya inchi yetu, hakuna matata. Right. Um, I'd like to introduce to you uh, a person who inspired me into joining uh, gifted education programs when I was still a young man. Our first keynote speaker is an educationist, a psychologist, a neurodeveloper who has been uh, professor at the University of South Africa for very many years, doubling up as also the president of the National Association for the Gifted and Talented Children in South Africa. Uh, she was also for nine years a member of the executive committee of the World Council for Gifted and Talented Children. In 1995, she founded Radford House in South Africa the only school in South Africa that caters for gifted and talented children. She has published many books. I understand one has already been translated into Chinese and um, a couple of others have been able to help even teacher retraining programs. May we all join our hands as we welcome Dr. Shirley Cocott. Thank you. <laughs> that is now our language. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening, everyone. later. I've been asked to speak about legacy tonight. And so I'm going to talk about the story of founding a school, 
which I think is going to be my legacy. Now, looking back over the years, the image I hold in my mind of the field of gifted education is that of a tree. The roots go deep, the branches spread wide, and regularly the tree bears fruit. And some of this fruit nourishes and enriches others. Some falls to the ground and results in new growth. The fruit is the legacy of those that have been working hard in the many and diverse areas that comprise this field. And those of us who continue to work with gifted children have really benefited so much from it. One little seed resulted, resulting or resulted in the sprouting and growth of a school for gifted children in Johannesburg, South Africa in 1996. Um, this is the only school of its kind in the country. Now, Radford House might be my legacy to South Africans, but it would not have existed were it not for the legacies of others. My presentation today then will tell you the story of Radford and how the legacies of many others resulted in its, what I believe, is a unique approach. Now, South Africa in the pre-1994 era, in the years leading up to the eradication of apartheid in South Africa, gifted education was a growing healthy plant. Although children were not officially tested for giftedness during the 1960s, brighter children were provided for. They were allowed to take classes at higher grade levels, meaning not a higher grade, but we had within our grades, we would have a lower grade, a standard grade, and a higher grade. And also they were allowed to take additional subjects in high school, such as computer science and advanced mathematics. The trend, therefore, in education was to offer differentiated education, differentiated instruction to learners of varying levels of ability. This slowly led to a focus on the identification of giftedness. At the first World Conference for Gifted and Talented Children in London in, 19, in 1975, South Africa was one of the countries represented at that conference and for the next 20 odd years maintained a presence there and at other world conferences. One of the earliest South African pioneers who sowed the seeds of interest in the 1970s was Jack Omond. At the beginning, he was virtually a lone campaigner for the cause of gifted children. And in, from the early uh, 1970s, and he gradually became nationally and internationally recognized for his enthusiastic dedication to providing for extraordinarily bright children. But official support for his beliefs was not first, uh, forthcoming at first, and he, like so many of us, had to pursue his ideals on his own. He established the Office for the Gifted and Talented in the Eastern Cape Province in June of 1976, with the aim of providing extracurricular and extramural opportunities for children seeking challenge. And he persevered, and through that perseverance, supported of course by others, led to the spread of similar extracurricular centers in other provinces, which were all run by our education departments. This had the effect of raising awareness amongst schools and families of the concept of giftedness and the need to offer education commensurate with their unique potential. And so in South Africa, gifted education peaked in the 80s. Mitchell and Williams investigated the state of the art of gifted education um, in member and non-member countries of UNESCO this was in 1987, and they found that, and I quote, the two developed nations that led the world in level of commitment to gifted and talented education are Israel and South Africa. How times have changed. Because unfortunately, South Africa's interest in gifted children in those days extended only slightly to non-white groups, those groups designated as non-white. 
other races were comparatively poorly served. And so it's not surprising that education authorities in the new democratic South Africa considered singling out of children with advanced abilities as totally contrary to the ideals of equality and inclusion. Special provision for gifted learners was considered elitist and racist. And this led to the closure of all gifted programs, the widespread canceling of specialized university courses in gifted education and very limited coverage of giftedness in teacher education courses. In spite of this, classroom teachers were, and still are, identified as the primary resource for achieving the goal of inclusive education, which theoretically includes differentiated instruction for gifted and talented learners. The reality is that without sufficient training, teachers have limited understanding of the nature and needs of giftedness and are not equipped with the knowledge or the skills to cater for the gifted child. The schools have no mandate to provide for highly able children. Currently, it is honestly not unusual for some of the most expensive private schools in our country to tell parents to find another school if they voice their children's frustrations, boredom, or unhappiness. This was the situation that prompted some parents to begin agitating for a special school for the gifted. And I was the person whom they identified as the likely creator of such a school. So in 1995, I began to dig my own garden and a little tree that we called Radford House Primary School was planted in January 1996 with just 32 learners. And there they are. Now, the list of people who influenced the teaching approach of Radford is very long. Some of the stalwarts of gifted education whose legacies provided me with the inspiration, knowledge, and tools to cultivate my garden need to be acknowledged as I go along. The very first thing that we had to do was to formally adopt a definition of giftedness that would guide the identification of gifted learners and subsequently their admission to the school. Is anybody here going to contradict me when I say that's not easy? <laughs> so, the word definition means a precise statement of the essential nature of a thing. A good definition of giftedness should help clarify understanding of exactly what giftedness is and so help us to recognize gifted children and have a way of identifying them. But as we know, giftedness is not a phenomenon that lends itself easily to such a simple definition. People have been trying to identify giftedness for many years and the fact that no consensus has yet been reached regarding the aptness of a single definition is an indication of the many divergent views that still exist regarding this complex matter. Now, way back then, I found that many of the existing definitions didn't tell the full story. I found them misleading in that they tended to be general statements and usually referred to strengths and ignored the weaknesses. Many of you will rem remember this one. This is an early version of Joseph Renzulli's triad model, which we knew better as the three-ring definition. And it serves as an example. Um, it read, gifted behavior reflects an interaction among three basic clusters of human traits. Above average general or specific abilities, high levels of task commitment, and high levels of creativity. Now, can you see how fraught with problems this was? Finding above average general or specific abilities often means resorting to IQ tests. Otherwise, it's very difficult to tell whether a young child's abilities are truly in advance of her age group. Many parents have told me that they are unsure of whether their child is advanced or not because they have nothing to compare with. Others believe their child to be gifted because she's above the class average at school. 
not helpful. High levels of motivation are not often present in children when it comes to schoolwork, especially if they have been in an under-stimulating school environment. We find that many of the older children that we admitted to Radford House had lost their interest in learning, and the level of underachievement among gifted children is alarmingly high. And then high levels of creativity are also difficult to judge. Parents and teachers do not always understand the difference between the natural creativity of children and signs of really high potential. And the definition also leaves out mention of pretty typical but problematic characteristics of giftedness. For example, the unbalanced development in intellectual, emotional, physical, social areas that may be present in a gifted child that so often results in a failure by less well-informed adults to recognize signs of potential ability. And other hindrances to displaying gifted behavior, as understood by many of us, are the intensity and supersensitivity that are part of the emotional domain of giftedness. The non-conformity, the spontaneity of high creativity, results in labels of difficult, immature, obnoxious. And what about the impulsiveness and high energy levels that look so much more like attention deficit hyperactivity disorder? And then, making it more difficult, in South Africa, we have a cultural attitude towards giftedness that makes it more difficult to aptly describe the state that we may understand as high ability. I've had so many parents telling me that their child is gifted because he can sing songs so nicely, or she can recite poems to her family that she learned at school, or he can play soccer, or she is so creative because she loves drawing pictures. He can name all the cars that he sees. So these opinions, oops, these opinions reflect that, that egalitarian view that all children are gifted. And the definition I cited, which was used way back then, of Renzulis, would be accepted by all of these parents as applying to all of their children. So for this reason, a view of giftedness had to be found that would allow us to develop our own approach to identification and the provision of a teaching approach that would suit the children. Okay. Now, Although many people followed his lead, Paul Whitty was, I believe, the first to question narrow definitions of giftedness, or those based entirely on IQ, in favor of broader constructs. I had long been a supporter of this view, but nevertheless was aware that in some countries, broader definitions were official, yet, in spite of that, admission to gifted programs was often based solely on IQ scores and I didn't want to fall back on this simplistic solution. Another voice from the past that influenced me was Lita Hollingworth. She wrote the book, Gifted Children, Their Nature and Nurture, way back in 1926. This was the first major textbook concerning the psychology and education of gifted children. And at that time, some influential writers, such as Louis Terman, believed that giftedness was hereditary born and bred in one's DNA. But Hollingworth believed that opportunity in a society is necessary if natural ability is to develop and come to fruition. Her basic tenet was that one's genes might make it possible for you to do something, but your environment will probably be the determining factor in what you actually do. This led her to emphasize the importance of the social and emotional development of ch gifted children and youths. And looking at the relative dearth of gifted individuals in influential, influential positions worldwide today, I recall her words very often. And so I believe that these two views, among others, were influential in the compilation of certain definitions that ultimately shaped my own. Theoretical definitions developed that took a multifaceted view of talents and abilities. Among those earlier colleagues and teachers who influenced my choice of a definition were Franz Monks, 
who added a second triad to Renzulli's by including environmental aspects such as family, the peer group, and school. Abram Tannenbaum concurred with his emphasis on the importance of the individual's interaction with the life world for the emergence of demonstrated high ability. Barbara Clark believes giftedness to be dependent on of both nature and nurture, comprised of an integration of, of four specific brain functions. Do you remember that? Thinking, feeling, intuition, and sensation within a supportive, empowering environment. Then Francois Gagny integrated these views in his model of giftedness and distinguished between giftedness and talent. He considered giftedness as corresponding to competence, which is distinctly above average in one or more areas of ability, while talent refers to distinctly above average performance in one or more fields of human intelligence. Then Howard Gardner came along and rocked the boat a little bit with his fresh take on human ability as outlined by his theory of multiple intelligences. He sees giftedness in a different light to the previous theorists, yet his work suggests that special abilities, while always present, need a supportive environment to reach fruition. So he also doesn't quarrel with the belief that the life world of the child is crucial to the actualization of giftedness. And then yet another very different point of view was presented by Pichovsky, who regarded giftedness as a higher level of development that individuals may achieve under optimal conditions. He sees giftedness as being made up of special talents and abilities and over-excitabilities, which are intense reactions to experience. And these intensities serve to characterize giftedness. Along with these theorists, I also learned of views from a different field of study, proposing that individuals exist because of and within an interactive network of relationships. So accordingly, I came to believe that giftedness is biologically rooted in the child and develops as an expression of a system of inter interrelated influences within the child's inner and outer environment. This means that the child may be born with the genetic potential for giftedness in one or more fields in their neurological structures, but this potential needs to be nurtured to fruition by and within the ch children's life worlds. And the life world is composed of a network of relationships. Children form relationships with, and here's a schematic representation, they form relationships with the inner self, aspects of the inner self, as well as with all the people, objects, concepts, and other aspects of reality that constitute their environments, including their homes, their schools, their peer group. And the relationships with outer reality must really be of a nature and quality that challenge and foster re realization of giftedness in the child's inner reality, those affective, cognitive, cognitive, and physical aspects. Thus, that creates conditions that are necessary for the emergence of giftedness. Okay. Now, on the basis of that view, um, I define giftedness as an inherent potential which can be latent or realized for above average achievement in one or more areas that have value for a specific culture. And the realization of this potential is dependent on the nature and quality of the individual's relationships with aspects of reality in the home, school, society, and the self throughout the lifespan. So, we move on then to how do children become admitted, or how do we admit children to Radford? The word potential has deliberately been included in the definition, and because of this means that, at least as far as performance is concerned, they can fall into a number of categories. For example, those who already perform and at an outstanding general level, or 
have the potential to perform at an outstanding general level. Then you might have those who already perform in a specific area or who have the potential to perform outstandingly in a specific area. Then you also have those who have the potential or who are able to perform outstandingly but do not. And these, of course, are the so-called underachievers, including our twice exceptional learners. So, using the word potential means that not necessarily all the children entering Radford are performing at an extraordinarily high academic level in all areas. In fact, taking into consideration that environmental factors are significant in developing giftedness, many of these learners, who initially may be scoring lower than the usual IQ scores suggesting intellectual giftedness, may show surprising strengths when exposed to stimulating and challenging content and teaching methods. Probably helping this is the neural plasticity of the brain, meaning that experiences can stimulate an increase in dendrite branching and synaptic connections. Okay. Um, and we know that the brains of gifted individuals have many connections and a very healthy uh, insulation around their axons. And this is possibly the reason why um, these children need higher levels of complexity, depth, novelty, acceleration in their learning experiences. The brain of a child showing potential may have the hard wiring in place, but as yet may need an enriched environment to turn that potential into reality. So this is why we can't consider intelligence as a fixed, rigid measure, but it's flexible and dynamic. A broader view of performance, taking into consideration the immense potential of the human brain, helps to avoid too much emphasis on achievement. All too often, gifted individuals are defined in terms of external measures, such as school marks, awards, ultimate career choice, status, and wealth. Giftedness isn't any of that. Giftedness is a state of being. It's an internal differentness from the norm. We all understand the importance of realizing that a child is gifted 24-7 and not only for an hour a day in maths class. Whether or not giftedness finds expression in achievement or unusual performance, the internal individual differences remain. Being able to recognize this inherent differentness makes it possible to see a child's potential. The question then arose as to how we could nurture both demonstrated and potential abilities in the children. This question was answered by designing our teaching approach at gifted learners. This ends up with us teaching proactively, meaning that we nurture potential in all children. Proactive teaching was a concept I learned from Eddie Braggart. Um, it means the opposite of reactive teaching. When teaching reactively, one assumes that children at a certain age are on a certain level of development. This implies a fixed notion of intelligence and development. So once the teacher or curriculum planner has decided on the level of a particular age group, a program will be designed and presented to the class. In terms of gifted programs, Eddie Braggart said that teachers following the reactive model will say in effect, when somebody selects the students for us, we will respond and do something for them. So gifted children must first be identified and then the teacher will respond and provide a gifted program, if you're lucky. But in contrast, the proactive model provides a program appropriate for encouraging and stimulating intellectual development and then closely monitors which children respond and develop gifted behavior. And this can be done in, in various ways. For example, we can allow more speed of work working at greater depth and scope, 
thinking more critically, solving problems, more independent learning, following special interests, social interaction with like-minded peers, which is so incredibly important for gifted children, exploring the world of learning, opportunities for self-evaluation, and so on. So in this way, teaching can stimulate children to develop their talents and interests and also help to diagnose the strengths and the weaknesses in each child. With original teacher-pupil ratios of 1 to 15 in Radford House, now changed unfortunately to 1 to 18 um, in the light of unfortunate economic realities, it was possible to offer a challenging program that allowed for individual differentiation. This enabled us to assess children's work at their own level, rather than judging their performance against a class norm or some other standardized measure. An example of this would be the absence of reading groups in the lower grades. Reading books range from the lowest of the, gra of the range of readers that are used to novels up to three or four years above the norm. Each child reads at his or her own level. Another example, is adding bonus marks for attempting more challenging work. A spelling test may comprise a list of 10 words, and then two others that are unlearned, but rely on the same spelling principles that are being studied. Some children may get 10 out of 10 and be very pleased with their 100% result. Others may get 12 out of 10 correct and take home a score of 120%. So the teaching approach is geared for high intelligence as well as multiple intelligences. The aim is to foster and develop higher level thinking skills through thematic teaching that focuses on process as well as products and qualitative meaningful assessment. One of the favorite sayings at Radford and one that guides the intervention with children is that we teach children how to think, not what to think. Let me give you some examples of the Radford approach. More giants that, whose life work has contributed towards Radford's teaching approach include good old Benjamin Bloom, Howard Gardner, Edward de Bono. Although being far from the new kid on the block, Bloom's taxonomy of learning remains a very concrete and very easy aid to teachers in their search for stimulating higher level thinking skills and being careful not to miss out on any. Similarly, Howard Gardner provides structure and inspiration for fostering different intelligences in the classroom, while de Bono offers interesting activities that help cultivate flexible problem solving and other thinking skills. But a key strategy is thematic teaching. Several themes are covered during the year. Generally speaking, our years are divided into four terms, as we call them, and the children select a theme for each term. The children select the theme. And several themes then are covered during the year. The teacher's job is to ensure that the prescribed curriculum content is covered within each. Occasionally, lessons are given outside the theme, such as math, science, languages, for the development of specific skills. Um, but generally speaking, they enjoy their themes. Um, so the students select a theme democratically, which the teacher then designs according to the skills that the children need to develop in a particular year. There's a picture of a, of a grade five class busy with a war theme. This results, of course, in much work for the teacher. And as the interests and levels of ability of the children differ from year to year, um, it's not always easy. Teaching at Radford is by no means an easy ride. An example of the type of theme selected is a very early one. It was covered in 1997 uh, in the second year of the school's existence in grade two. The children wanted to learn something in history and after discussion decided they would like to find out how people in the past managed to survive without all the infrastructures that modern society has. So the teacher helped out a bit and selected 1652 
as the theme. Now that's the year of the first European settlers in South Africa. The theme covered the history of the white settlers as well as the influx of black peoples from North Africa. It focused on survival. How did they survive? But included map work for the geography, maths. An example is how many apples would Van Riebeck have needed to put on board ship to last all the sailors during the voyage. Literacy, they read Jan van Riebeck's diary and they, then they wrote their own diary as they imagined it would have been like on board ship. Second and third languages, for example, they put on a mini play about the meeting of Zulu-speaking peoples with the Afrikaans or Dutch settlers. Life skills, how do you communicate when a common language is absent? Interpersonal problem solving, such as the situation dictated in the mini play. Then science was also covered and they had to uh, present an experiment to prove that things float on water. And history, self-research into the reasons for the settlement being established and conditions on the voyage, conditions amongst the black people and so on. The curriculum is covered a bit more closely in the older classes, but themes are designed around prescribed content. For example, the grade six curriculum in one of the early years required a study of an ancient civilization. So the grade six class was presented with a question. The Romans, were they conquerors or thieves? And that launched the theme. And during the brainstorming sessions, the theme was developed to cover many areas, including a comparison of the Greek and Roman way of life, the reading of Greek and Roman myths, writing a myth about the founding of Johannesburg, the history of Rome, including its rise and fall, lifestyles of Romans, their language, the influence they had on the world, a geographical study of Italy, including climatology, Roman numerals in mathematics, the construction of the aqueducts, and much, much more. So apart from integrating subject matter into the theme, teachers also then carefully consider the types of activities that children are required to do. Gardeners, multiple intelligence intelligences. And each classroom has lists of creative and critical thinking skills displayed, as well as De Bono's court program. These serve as reminders for the teachers to focus on these aspects, but also as ready references for the children. It, it's not uncommon to hear a teacher stop a class and say, that's an interesting point you have raised. Let's do a quick PMI on it. I remember having some very puzzled grade one parents phone me in the early days and to ask, what is this PMI that my child has to do for homework as well? Let me give you an example of that. Um, yes, we don't have bells, by the way. The bells ring for the start of school, the end of school, and recess, but the rest of the time, the children are allowed to run with the topic. An example would be the grade, in grade five, I, I was there, fascinated one day. They were busy examining a corn plant. We call it a milli, other people call it maize. And one of the children said, is a milli, a fruit or a vegetable? What do you think? Asked the carefully trained teacher. Now this began a discussion about the difference between fruits and vegetables in order to answer the question. And the children began discussing this with some venturing to give an opinion only to have their ideas challenged by others. Then after a long while, one child came up with the following and he said, I think that the difference is that a vegetable is part of the plant itself, like a carrot is the root, and a cabbage is the leaf, and the cauliflower is the flower. But the fruit is something that the plant produces and can become separate from the plant. No one could criticize this idea, so the teacher allowed a group to go and look up the answer uh, in an encyclopedia. And they confirmed that this idea, in fact, was very close to the truth. And there was such an excited buzz that they had been able to discover the truth for themselves. 
Then they became further stimulated when another child, still reading the encyclopedia, commented that orange were, oranges were classified as berries, but lemons are not. And then they wanted to begin another discussion about this puzzle and determine the difference between berries and fruit. But then it was time for, for break. They had at this stage been busy for one hour and 30 minutes with this animated discussion. And throughout this, the teacher did little more than just give them opportunities to speak. She clarified, she encouraged, and she helped to control the enthusiasm and the noise levels. But her task for that afternoon was to write out the children's findings so that they could include this knowledge into the content to be studied for possible assessment, exams, and the rest later on. Let me give you some examples of some of the some of the themes. Grade twos did a fairy tales. They chose a fairy tales as a theme, which fits in very nicely with Hans Christian Andersen. And activities and lessons were planned around the subject syllabus requirements, such as English language, Bloom's taxonomy, and multiple intelligences. And you can see there at the table includes some of those ideas. They had to define a fairy tale. They had to compare a myth to a fairy tale. They had to analyze the structure of the story, etc., etc. And the teachers were aware of what they were doing because they could see, according to Bloom's taxonomy, what level of thinking skills were being addressed. And so we go on. Um, environmental studies. Same story, a list of activities that they had to cover, comparing fairy tales from different countries. How does culture influence the story, etc., etc. Mathematics, survey and compare relevant data, e.g., what animals are used and how frequently in different fairy tales, and select the type of graph that you can use to present your information. Drama and music, life skills, and so on, all can be adequately covered in this way. They, were chore they choreographed a fairy dance for music. Life skills, they had to express feelings about a topic. How did Hansel and Gretel feel when they were locked up, etc., etc. And in addition to the type of lessons and activities that I've shown you here, they also had to do an own research theme. And um, they were taught one of the few available research models, which we use to teach children the process of research, rather than to allow them to haphazardly gather material. You know, I, I experienced that very much when I was teaching at the university, and you have master students coming in who didn't have a clue about how to research something. Um, so it was important for us to do that as well. Then, Radford can't just be all of this covering of subject matter and thinking skills in the classroom. These children have wide-ranging abilities and wide-ranging interests. And if you are a school for gifted children, one of the challenges is how do we cover everything? You don't want them sitting in a classroom all day. So there are extramural activities that we offer. An array of sports, soccer, cricket, swimming, gymnastics, golf, archery. Mm. Athletics, netball, volleyball, hockey, and table tennis are among some. Um, languages. Well, French has been around for a long time. Currently, they all have the opportunity to learn Portuguese, and they're also learning essay sign language. Um, arts and art techniques. Um, ballet and chess. All form part of the extracurricular program from which they can select activities. But that's not enough, because these children are seeking challenge all the time. And so we have to also offer them additional enrichment, apart from the normal classroom activities. And how this happens is once every term, between one and four days is taken for pure enrichment. Now, those days are often selected between a weekend and a possible public holiday, and that would be the ideal time. And school stops, and all the teachers are involved in offering an enrichment uh, program. It could be the enrichment subject topic, could be literary genres. That shows a, a teacher reading from, um, oh dear, um, Terry Pratchett's story. 
And with, you know, dressing up to make it nice and real, this is another enrichment um, with an archaeological flavor. So they will spend up to one to three days just being involved in, 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 in topics that are not covered by the curriculum. And that's not enough because children have wide-ranging abilities and interests. So in addition to the enrichment, they also have what we call electives. And here, they, allow, they are allowed to choose an elective for the year. And every year, they have a choice of up to about 25 different subject areas, um, which change every year. And this, they will dedicate 90 minutes, one and a half hours, and they go off to their electives for the week. And here they are not kept in their same age groups. Children from all ages are allowed to select whatever they want to do. And so we have mixed ages um, in small groups. And there are many different kinds of, of uh, electives. There's a group busy with um, an aspect of science. But generally speaking, electives fall into four broad categories. To do with the brain, intellectual, you might have subjects such as philosophy, amazing animals, computer programming, mythology, science, and so, and so on. Um, to do with the body, more kinetic horticulture, Sport and games, foods of the world, they have a kitchen where they go into food science, nutrition, um, food chemistry, and they, they cook. They do life hacks, they do woodwork, metalwork. You can see there a picture of a, a group of boys with metal and glass tables that they made. Here are a couple of, a few children, those were busy with first aid, that was an elective, and building electrical circuits, which was part of life hacks. And then creativity, of course, um, the arts, or pottery, or drama, or music, or electronic composing, whatever they would fancy. And lastly, we have the more social choice. Um, there is a picture of children who had been involved with the charity club, the debating society, they have social clubs, entrepreneurship, all of that type of thing would fall under that particular heading. In spite of that, we still have parents wanting more. But the children have a lot of enrichment. But now, we do still have challenges. In spite of very sincere efforts on the part of all the children, or I mean all the teachers, some children still fail to thrive. Now, in some cases, this isn't a cause for puzzlement. We find that when older children are admitted to the school, because of growing disinterest in learning and working and resulting underachievement, it is difficult to rekindle their motivation. And this is well documented, though, and we weren't surprised when this happened. We are prepared for many frustrations, particularly if the parents are unwilling to work with the teachers as a team, or if the child has many negative relationships in his or her life world. Other problems that our learners have in common with gifted children worldwide and that present challenges to our teaching staff include things like an active dislike for writing things down, excellent but misplaced manipulation skills, high energy levels, impulsivity that can sometimes disrupt classroom events, sensitivity and intensities that cause outbursts in classrooms and on the playground, and poor social skills. A fairly common characteristic is a pronounced lack of insight into own contribution to unpleasant situations, but a very keen sense of justice regarding others. We are constantly amazed by the ease with which a child can tearfully report somebody else's nasty, unjustified, and unfair behavior towards him, and then promptly turn around and perform exactly the same action on a third party. 
Some children frustrate themselves in that they claim to know how to do various activities and can verbally describe to the finest detail how these should be done. But due to that inner lack of emotional stability and control, they can't bring themselves to persevere with practicing the skills needed for these activities, like writing, playing tennis, reading, maths. Some are very careless about the appearance of their work, general untidiness, and lack of regard for detail. I get the big picture. Why must I bother about all these petty little details? That's, that's found a lot. It's actually maybe even more, more common than the perfectionism that is said to be so characteristic of high ability. Um, and this latter characteristic, perfectionism, is more obvious in children's reluctance to try tasks which they feel they will not be able to handle than in their desire to complete or present perfect work. In the early years of the school, we found that about 15% of the children were enrolled less for their need of a more challenging, stimulating environment, but rather in the hope that the school with its individualized teaching approach and small class numbers would be able to somehow deal better with the, pro the problem behavior than other schools could. But this problem has naturally lessened over the years as demand for the school has grown and admission requirements have become more stringent in the light of few available places. Currently, I do believe that there's a waiting list for virtually all the classes. It's been hard to turn away promising students because of demonstrated difficult behaviors, but it's equally hard to cope with the dynamics set in place in a very small class by one or two children. But with increasing experience of both successes and failures, the school is now better able to judge what kinds of problems can be managed within the school and which children would be better helped by other alternative education programs. In the meantime, we do rejoice in those children for whom we have made a significant difference and whose parents confirm this by their loyal support and encouragement. We have turned children around. Other problems, I forgot to click. Other problems concern the attitudes of adults towards gifted children. In some cases, adults seem to be very label bound. Okay? And their child is identified as gifted. This means that their child is gifted and must, then they buy the books on giftedness, including my own. And they will come and accuse us of doing something wrong because, look, this is a gifted child, my son is a gifted child, and we've overlooked the fact that he may have this characteristic because that's what being gifted is all about. And look what the teacher is doing and not taking into account that he's probably got that. In other words, they're, very, they're not looking at the child. It's more of a, my child is gifted, therefore he must be like this. Um, it's a challenge to dealing with the parents. Huh. Yet, another area which concerns the school is the difficulty experienced by some children who apply for admittance into higher grades. Those children starting at Radford at a young age drive the teaching program and their abilities push the level of achievement way beyond normal schools. Children come in later find it very difficult to cope with the high standard of the classes and may experience stress when trying to keep up with the pace of others. So even though they have the potential ability to perform at these higher levels, their schooling experience has poorly prepared them for life at Radford. The school is now trying to limit, limit later um, admittance to avoid this. But perhaps the biggest problem of all is teacher training. Bearing in mind that South African teacher training courses contain very little on gifted education. It falls on the school to select teachers who seem to be open to the experience of teaching in a way very, very different from either private or government schools. And also we look for teachers who show the capacity to work with gifted learners. Rigid teachers who want children to sit down and be quiet, are they going to cope? No and they don't. So once employed, these teachers have to be trained to understand firstly the nature and needs of gifted children, and then to be encouraged 
to change their teaching methods and adapt to what we call the Radford approach. Teacher training happens at least twice, I think now, every, every quarterly term, with constant ongoing intervention with teachers who show the need for this. This is possibly why, in spite of us having numerous requests from other parts of the country for more schools, they want more Ratfords everywhere, we cannot do it because it's too much hands-on teacher training. We cannot leave the teachers to just take it and run with it. And then a further ongoing problem is not unique to a school for gifted, but is found to be common in all schools. And this is the seemingly growing number of children who present with difficulties in meeting the expectations of um, school and home. We are aware of the twice exceptional child, and I see the behavioral and learning problems of many of these children as having a neurodevelopmental root or the result of environmental toxins, such as, um, or offenders rather, not toxins, toxins is an offender, but there are also poor diets that can offend and unhealthy digestive systems which affect the way the brain works. And as a result of the Radford children presenting with these symptoms of learning challenges, I had to search for the answers. Um, consequently, I founded the Center for Integrated Learning Therapy, better known as ILT. And that is now a very well-established approach for helping overcome these problems. And I gave a workshop this morning on it. So, my focus on children's needs has centered around ILT for the past decade or so. And Ratford House is no longer my school. I handed it over to our son, Philip Cockett, who has been instrumental in growing it in both size and quality for a number of years now. He has shown that he values my legacy in that the mission and the core approach continues intact. But nevertheless, he's in the process of creating his own legacy through very innovative additions and creative amendments to the education that these children receive. He's also constantly building on, and I believe a high school is envisaged in the near future. But I cannot thank him enough for undertaking the challenge to continue what we started 20 years ago and to improve it in so many ways. So my garden is being maintained and provides lots of comfort and shade for gifted children. But I have to base all of this on my interactions with the many, many educators and theorists around the world that I had the privilege of meeting in my time with the World Council, particularly. Because if it wasn't for them teaching me, I would not have had the tools to put together this pretty unique school. And so all of those shared insights, I know how valuable it is for you all to be here and, and to share and gain insight and knowledge. And we need all of that if we are all to grow our own gardens successfully. Thank you. You know the difficulty with the intelligent people. They try to squeeze all the intelligence in a very short uh, speech. And this is one of the short ones. <laughs> um, uh, before you go away, Shirley, I am sure the audience uh, must have a few questions. Okay. Um, and and uh, I'd like you to take a few questions. Uh, just before then, um, I'd like to congratulate you for doing a good succession planning um, in terms of getting your son into it. I'm trying also that my son, um, who is doing things completely different away from me. Thank you so much. Um, if you have a cordless mic, uh, that would be very useful. You got it there, okay? Um, we'll take four questions, two from ladies, two from gentlemen. Ooh. Fairness in Denmark. Uh, and I'm the chair. <laughs> we have the oh, yeah, there, there is a hand there. Uh, <laughs> no, get, get the mic. The mic is there next to you. Thank you. So, 
So we would very much like to know from where you got the money to open the school. Have you heard of an overdraft? <laughs> we borrowed money from the bank. My family did that for me. They supported me in this. And um, yeah, many a sleepless night. <laughs> Another question? Just to say that that was the same that we did in Denmark. They did the same in Denmark. Yeah. <laughs> mm. If you got better eyes than I do, just, just show the guy of the mic. May I ask my son to answer that? Um, because this is his field. Philip, where are you? There he is. Microphone. No, no, you won't be heard. Yes, another question. Just behind this, this guy must be from Kenya. You see, he's having marathon jeans. He's running. <laughs> I do know what you mean. Yeah. No, we, we are not very keen on formalizing that type of thing. We don't like judging the children against standardized norms particularly. Um, for many years, I was the one who did all the assessments for admission to the school. And um, it's a long uh, gathering of history and developmental information. How did the child develop? What characteristics do they show? That the parents can give us, if need be, you can gather that from others as well. And then at the end, I do an IQ test. But by the time I do the IQ test, I've admitted that child or not. Because you look for the potential, if you understand the nature and needs of a child. I think Philip and I used to talk about this. And we used to say to each other, after five minutes with a child, we know if we're going to admit him or not. You get to know intuitively whether a child is going to fit. And then we say to the child, come and try out the school. I always say to them, coming to a new school is like buying a pair of shoes. You need to see if they fit. And if when the children come in and they spend a few days up to a week at the school and their eyes start to sparkle, we know that that child is going to do well. So I, we are not very happy with the idea that children have to meet some outside criteria. We go on our own understanding of giftedness and we recognize it in children. And we haven't often been wrong. <laughs> Last question. Um, Over there. Yeah, but I've only seen ladies. Um, it's only ladies. Touch. Uh, unless the ladies want to be gentlemen. Uh, <laughs> Um, did, did I find a gentleman? Yeah, here. Excuse me. <laughs> there. Where? Oh, we got him. Yeah. Yeah. Would you mind if you tell us about the main mistakes that you have done in your school or in your garden and that you say to yourself, I will not get this again? Uh, mistakes. 
I, I'm not sure. I can't even, that's a, that's a good question and I'm trying to think hard. Philip, help me out here. Um, I wouldn't do it again because it was very, very stressful. In the first years, people come into a new school, they want it. They know that their children are, are asking for it, but they are very suspicious because we are so different. So they want it to be different, but then they get scared because it is different. I remember, for example, and it's not a mistake, but this is one of the, the difficulties I experienced when a parent would come in and say, mm, you know, my sister's child is at Northcliffe Primary, it's a government school down the road, and his history book is this thick, full of work and notes, and my child's is this thick. Because at Radford, we don't teach them what to think. We teach them how to think. We use the content as a media for getting them to develop their abilities. So my answer to her was, well, we don't want them to have all the knowledge in their books. We want them to have it in their brains. And the children do go on. I can, I can, I can um, say this with a great amount of confidence. The high schools wait for them. They're allowed into some of our prestigious private schools without even going through an entrance exam. Radford now has a reputation for excellent education. And I personally believe that this education is not necessarily for giftedness. I believe it's just an excellent education. <laughs> Thank you. But I'm sure we've made mistakes over the last 20 years. But I have to think about that one before I can honestly answer it. I'll ask Philip too. And you can catch us during the week and maybe we'll have an answer for you. I think uh, we need to appreciate Shali one more time. <laughs> I will be presenting Shali uh, with some gifts of appreciation for taking time from South Africa <laughs> all the way to audience. That's what they what? say. Yeah? <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is our gift of appreciation from the World Council for Gifted and Talented Children. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. Oh, that's from the World Council. This is from us. Oh. <laughs> yes, I'll just take over here because we have some, we've obviously we have some gifts, uh, gifts for the keynotes. Could you please open just one of them? Mm -hmm. It is, uh, we want to thank Lego Education for sponsoring our gifts. So now you know what's in it, but uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, yep, it, it is. Um, yep, we have a short break now for about 10 minutes. We're running a little behind schedule. So we will get right on uh, with the ballet school after the break. Uh, and just if you want to stretch your legs, just do so for a couple of minutes. And then we'll meet here again, and we will have the ballet children dance for us in 10 minutes. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah.